Good morning or good afternoon, um, wherever you may be. Uh, this is Tim Todek, Director of HDX Will, and this is part of our weekly WebEx series on functions of on-demand. Um, we are going to be showing uh, images from our uh, dentary CBCT, and today's discussion topic is going to be uh, implant planning and being able to go through all the steps of implant planning and some of the features that we have with on-demand that allow us to be able to do a whole lot more to make sure that your implant planning experience is, um, is fruitful and that you can be able to do a number of different things with it. Uh, some housekeeping is that, uh, at least at first, that this is going to be recorded. So uh, that way, if you can't make it or if your clients can't make it, that you can go ahead and get the download and be able to send it to them so they can watch this at a later time. Um, so today we're going to go through and talk about um, doing implant planning and being able to uh, go through a full process of actually going through and putting a virtual implant in, being able to take a look at it and be able to examine that spot, examine the bone around it, and then be able to uh, make a determination for length and placement, and then also be able to talk about the, the uh, other features that we can do to make it to where you get a more comprehensive implant planning experience. Um, our last lecture, we talked about uh, using our CBCT for endodontics. And so going through that, we mostly stayed within the realm of our 3D module, which is over here. Uh, our 3D module is usually what we term as our diagnostic module. And it's where we can be able to go through and examine the bone, examine the structures of the bone and features associated with it. So in this case, uh, again, we have our same model, at least at first. And, and what we would want to do when we go to implant planning is we're going to want to go into the mandible. So if I were to go ahead and say that I want to be able to put an implant in, say, on the right side of this, I could, again, we talked about moving our circle over to the area of interest, creating that tangential line, and then being able to get our buccal lingual view. So under this circumstance, we're going to be looking at doing number 30. So we're going to look through and scan around the bones. So we can see the nerve canal here fairly clearly and we can see the teeth around it we can actually look around and see what we have available to us interestingly enough you can see that that uh, root right there being able to curve right around where the nerve is but being able to go ahead and walk through it and examine the bone from uh, that perspective and again just like i said before we turn this so that we can create a buccal lingual view in the one that we're looking at and then we can create a mesial distal view so it's focused on, on tooth number 29, and we're going to move it all the way to 30. So now we can get a mesial distal view of that area. Again, in this case, you can see this patient has a pretty significant undercut. And we can move along and we can see there's our tooth there. We can look at the bone structure. I can go ahead and blow this up a little bit. And I'll center it so that we can examine the tooth as it sits. And again, we can see the tooth in the bone itself. We can see the nerve canal and we can start to see some of the bone structure. And that way, again, at first in our 3D mode, we can look diagnostically at where we're going to go with this and look at the, the teeth around it, the bone structure, those type of things. So in this case, we're going to go ahead and move over to our implant planning portion of our software, which is called DVR, Dental Volume Reformat. This allows us to be able to go through and actually start to make the planning and create the spaces where we're going to put the implant in. So in this case, uh, the way that we always talk about doing this is I want to do it the same way every time to make sure it's right. So in the DVR mode, we have our 3D picture here. Uh, with a CBCT as opposed to a pano, we can actually be able to reposition the patient to get us better pictures. So in this case, we can see the head wasn't turned, uh, but we can also see under axis reslice, we can see that the head was slightly flexed. So I can actually take this and move it to where it's now flat with the occlusal plane, uh, that line right there. And that allows me to be able to make sure that I can get the perfect uh, spread of the jaw when I see it. You can see the head wasn't tilted in any way. So now we can go ahead and move that. Once we click OK, it now repositions our 3D model so that as we do any sort of planning from there, we're basically kind of creating the perfect pano out of our CBCT. So with that in mind, that blue line, again, indicates where we are on the axial plane. And then we're going to move that blue line down onto the mandible. We want to try to get around the tooth, yeah, the bone crown area. And then what we're going to ask to do is we ask to do an arch curve. An arch curve is designed to be able to make sure that you can spread out the jaw 
and create a panel, but it also creates a way in which we can now focus on certain areas a little bit easier to be able to do the implant planning. So in this case, we can go to arch curve here and choose our points ourselves. Usually what you're trying to do is you're trying to mid, find midpoint uh, points on the bone itself. So if we were going around, I would want to make mid, midpoint points through the middle of the teeth and up into the mandible itself. Uh, I can also be old and lazy and do the auto arch, and there we go. It already spreads it out for me. So it chooses those points automatically. So depending on your preference, if there's if you're not getting what you like with the uh, auto arch, that you can manually choose those spots to be able to do so. When you do that, you also have the ability to be able to change those. So I could go in here and I could modify the arch curve and say I wanted to move one of these dots in or out, I could do so by being able to move, grab that point, move it in, and you can see how the, the image changes. So I can grab the whole line. I can also grab an individual, individual point and move it, and you can see how the image changes. And then of course, if I just don't like the way it was done or I wanna do it over again, I can actually right click on one of those dots and actually delete this curve. So I'm gonna go ahead and delete that curve. We're gonna start over again. Again, same idea going through and we can go into auto arch and it spreads it out very nicely for us. Uh, now, the images that you're seeing in this module are gonna be the axial view. You're gonna see the panorama where it's spread out. Now, this panorama is about 0.1 millimeters thick. So as you start to look at this, that it's gonna be very thin, you're gonna see cutouts along the way because it's only taking a certain piece of that. Uh, this view up here is gonna be your cross-sectional wherever you choose it to be. Once you do this, once you do the, um, the arch curve that this immediately generates a pano. So up here, one of the icons is panorama. We can click on panorama and now it actually creates a automatic panorama from our arch curve. So there's different ways to view it. So this would be the uh, thin slice. This would be adding the slices together, which is more like a pano uh, of what you'd achieve if you were to do a pano generated by a CVCT. So just looking at this real quick, that you can see that we have a CVCT generated pano uh, you can see some of the areas are faded out because again, remember it's slices put together. So if I wanted to make sure I got all those structures of these back molars, I could be able to change our thickness. And now we've got more substance to what we're looking at in the pano. And again, in the end, we can turn on the filter and now we get a pretty sharp uh, pano from a CBCT and we're able to take a look at all those pieces along the way. Going back to dental, we're back at our four images that we had before. And so at this point, we can go down and if we're gonna do an implant, say in the 30 slot here on this model, that I wanna be able to mark a nerve. So I'm gonna go ahead and click on nerve. Keeping in the thin slice, that way I know from buccal lingual where that nerve is, I can go ahead and start making my points. So I'm gonna click inside the nerve canal. As I scroll through, again, Picking out those points, trying to find a very clear canal that I know where it is. I try to stay on the superior side as much as I can, because as a dentist and doing implants, that's where we're going to be able to interact with the nerve the most. Uh, as I move across, I can also see it in this plane. So if I'm not seeing it well here, or if I want to be able to see it in here, you can still choose those points as you move along. So we come in here, now we see the foramen. I'm going to double click to finish it. And now you can see the nerve here. We've already mapped out the nerve on that side. Again, you can do it on the other side if you desire, but that gives you the ability to be able to have your nerve mapped in place. Again, on our panorama, once you map the nerve, the nerve now shows up on your panorama as well. So going back to dental, that I wanna make this now, the panorama, a more decipherable image so that I know where I'm going. So I'm actually gonna add some thickness to it. And now it's more like a panorama that I'm used to seeing. That'll be something that will be helpful so that, again, I know where I am and where I wanna go. So in this case, we talked about doing number 30. We went through the 3D examination of number 30 to be able to kind of look at the structures, know that we have an undercut that we're gonna be dealing with at some point. So again, those going from 3D to DVR is important. So we assess where the implant's going to be and what we're going to do with that implant once we get there. So in this case, we wanna move right over to 30. 
you can either scroll your mouse on the cross sectional to move that blue line over. This blue line represents the image that you see up here in the cross sectional, or you can go to reference and actually click on the tooth that you want. Again, that blue line represents where this cro the cross sectional image up in the right hand corner is going to be. So I want to be able to tilt that image to match the angle of that tooth or the angle of where I want my implant to be. So I can actually move this cursor and I'm going to tilt it. So I get it exactly the same plane as that tooth. So I'm going to go right about here. And now that line shows it's a cross sectional right through the middle of number 30. And I can actually see that here. So I'm going to blow this picture up so we can work with it. So now we're in the cross sectional right in the middle of the tooth of the area number 30 that we're, we're examining. So at this point, we can take a look at the tooth. We can take a look at the bone again. Again, noted here is a nice undercut. So it's something that, again, is very helpful to have a CBCT to know that that exists, especially that far back in the molars. And it allows us to be able to understand the, uh, the, the bear traps involved in putting an implant in this area. So we can see the nerve and how it's marked out in the cross-sectional. And actually, if you look a little closer, you can actually see that the nerve canal expands beyond that nerve tracing. We can make the nerve thicker or smaller on our preferences down at the very bottom. We can actually open it up and ask to make the nerve thicker or smaller. In this case, I like to just use it as this is where the nerve is. And you can usually see the structures around it to be able to say, okay, I can see where the nerve canal ends. So at this point, we know where our implant's going to be. We can take a look at the bone. Let's go ahead and measure it to know the size area that we have. So we can click on ruler. In this case, I just want straight measurements, so the straight ruler is fine. And I'm gonna go from right at where I think the top of the nerve canal is, which is right about here. And another click again at where I think the crest is. And I'm just gonna move this off to the side. And it'll explain here in a second why I move it off to the side. But that gives you from nerve canal, the crest of the bone. And then I'm gonna measure from inside cortical to inside cortical. to get our measurements of the place where we can put in that implant. So now that we have that in place, I'm gonna go ahead and turn off my ruler so I don't make any more mistakes. But again, here's our measurements off to the side. So we're 11.92 long by 10. Now, as we go through there, that we can now choose an implant to decide where we want to be and what we wanna use. So I can click on implant. And in this case, we're gonna do pick in place because this will be that I picked out, we're gonna pick out the type of implant that we wanna use and where we're gonna place it. So I'm gonna click on pick and place. The on-demand software has been around for a fairly long period of time. And so you find that it has an extremely extensive uh, implant library as far as the type of companies that it can do. Uh, it is something to where uh, a lot of these companies have also given them uh, STL files. So you actually get to see an actual profile of the implant itself. Um, ah, I have a question already. Uh, uh, one of the questions was, am I able to modify nerve points to delete the nerve? We'll go back to that in just a second. I kind of passed through there a little bit. But uh, again, the idea being is, is that we have a large number of implants. So whatever implant company that you're using, more than likely we're gonna have a version of it within here. Uh, in this case, I'm gonna go ahead and do Glidewell today. I'm gonna open that up. And we have the types that they have. So let's just talk about a Han tapered. So now we have a Han tapered implant. And now this shows the parameters of sizes that they have. So we have an 11 by 10. So we're looking at somewhere that can probably give us an 8, uh, 8 to 10, somewhere around in here in length. So I'm just going to choose the Han tapered implant. And then in this case, we've taken out a tooth. So I'm going to just choose a 5 by 8 just for the example. Once you have that in place, you click OK. And it's going to ask me to find a place on the bone to put my implant. So in this case, I'm around here is where I'm going to want to put my implant. So I'm just going to click on it. Now, this section here allows you to be able to put it at the exact tooth number. It also marks the implant so that the implant is labeled 30. So as you go through and maybe you're re-examining the CBCT and you want to go straight to tooth number 30, that you've numbered it correctly and the implant will actually show that. So in this case, we're in the mandible. And we're going to go up here to tooth number 30, click on it, and click OK. Now, what we get is a, a new STL image of the implant itself. 
So what we get is an actual image with the thread pitch of the implant that we're going to be putting in this spot. And that allows us to be able to do that. It's numbered and it's also specific to the Glidewell implant that we chose. As we do that, we can take the implant, grab it at the number, left click, we can move that around. As we go down, as we get closer to the nerve, I have a cylinder around mine. You can take on or off the cylinder depending on your preference. The cylinder gives me a barrier of two millimeters. So as I get to the nerve, it's gonna turn pink saying you're close to the nerve. If I actually touch the nerve of the implant, it turns red. So it's got some safety features involved in being able to have that. So once I get my implant in place, I can actually move it around. I can go to the ends of it and I can tilt it. Maybe take a little less tilt in there and then center it where I want it to be so that I'm pretty happy with, I'm well within the buccal lingual walls, I'm well away from the nerve and I've got my implant in place. So now, once I'm happy with this image, then I can go back and again, much like I talked about in 3D, that uh, one view is no views. So what I wanna be able to do is I wanna be able to expand this view so I can actually look at it here. In this case, I see that I probably moved it a little bit mes uh, mesial, so I'm going to go ahead and scoot it just a little bit this way. And again, in real time, you'll change both images by where you want to put it. So now I'm a little bit more centered in that tooth and centered in here. And you can see as I scroll through, now we've got our measurements and where we're going from there. So now we have our implant virtually placed in place. And now it's time for us to be able to assess how the bone is around it and what it looks like. So one of the first things we can do is go into verification. A verification much like when we did the oblique in the 3D version, allows us to be able to click on it. And now it centers our X-ray or centers our images around where the implant is. So again, here's the implant in the middle of that tooth. And we have another view of it here. We have it here. What's nice about that is that we can now take this line and go 360 degrees around that implant. Now we can look at other tooth interactions. We can look at how close it is to the nerve canal into the nerve itself and in 360 degrees be able to examine that. So in this case, probably a, a big worry is having that undercut and now we can actually see where it is in, in relation to the undercut and see that we're safely in the buccal lingual walls but moving all the way around. We also have a 3D image down at the bottom right that allows us to be able to turn, again, look at it in a 3D image type of form to know where we are on the bone, how it sits, are we at bone level, and be able to examine all those. So now other features that we can do with this is that we can go through and here's our implant. And if I right click on the number itself, it gives me a number of different things that I can do. So in this case, that we are in the Han tapered implant and it's gonna give us a list of all those in case we wanna change it on the fly while we're looking at it. We can copy the implant so that if we wanna use the same implant in another area, we can copy it and move it to that area. We can replace the implant. So we can decide that we didn't like the size or the coverage and we can be able to replace it, rotate it, hide it, remove it completely, or you can actually lock the implant in place. So again, this is, this is good for me when I'm doing multiple cases and multiple uh, demonstrations that sometimes you get lost on which one you're, you're manipulating. And if you move one that you're pretty happy with, then you're upset because now you gotta go back and reset it. If you can lock it into place, you actually have to ask to unlock it before you can make any manip manipulations to that implant, that virtual implant that you put into place. And again, implant properties just gives you what size implant you had in there, those type of things. So now the next things we can do once that implant is in place is we can do things like an attachment abutment. So we can actually go through, and in this case, Glidewell has a, a number of their abutments already put into place. So we can be able to take a list of what abutments they are and see the different sizes. And they give us STL pictures so we can actually see what each of those abutments looks like and their sizes and, and height. We also can do a custom on any of these that allow, it, that, that allow for us to be able to create a custom abutment that you can change the height, you can change the angle, so that, again, it gives you an approximation in your planning as to where you're gonna put the abutment, how high you're gonna put the abutment. I actually had a very curious um, question the other day about how high can we make it? because what the doctor liked to do is if they were doing a, a procedure like in an all on four, that he wanted abutments very high so that he could make sure that he could tell that his implants are parallel to make it easier for when they finally put the final denture in that they had parallel implants. And so creating a high abutment here, I would just have to create an abutment of say maybe 30 in the abutment height 
to be able to make it easy to identify on the 3D model. In this case, I'm going to go back to these right here. And I'll choose this just for the sake of, of uh, putting an abutment on there as well. So I'm going to go ahead and choose that. And now you can see the abutment is now joined within there. And we can actually see it on our, on our model and on our planning in our virtual sense. Now, if I click back on the number again, on number 30, that we also can edit the abutment, rotate the abutment, detach the abutment, or that we can move on to some other things we can do. So down over here, we can change the color. So maybe it's easier to read if you change the color in the abutment or the implant. We've already done verification, which is where the segment that we're in right now. And then the other thing we can do is what we call a bone density graph. And this is where it gets kind of fun because in the past when you put in an implant, you were, uh, had a lot of it to do with the tactile feel. You can take a 2D image and be able to assess kind of the quality of the bone, but until you actually got in there and drilled the bone and started putting in an implant, were you more sure about your treatment plan, how good that bone was and how quickly you could load bear that bone? With something like a bone density graph, that this actually allows me to be able to get a numerical measurement in Hounsville units as to the quality of bone that's around there. So this gives us another secondary way of doing it. So I like to think of this as the qualitative and now quantitative version of being able to assess that bone and assess that implant that you're putting in. So before, when you were just going by the torque, now you're able to have something that can help you predict before that. And now the torque becomes a confirmational feel so that now you have two points of reference for you to decide that this is going to be a good implant with strong bone to hold it into place. So in this case, I put it in the middle of a tooth, so it's at the highest because the tooth is very solid around it. So I'm just gonna put a cylinder so we can actually see that we're inside the tooth. And then I'll grow that cylinder so we can be able to see a little bit more around to kind of gauge the quality of the bone that's out there. So now we're 4.5 millimeters away. And again, you can see looking straight down that there's our implant here, there's the middle of the tooth, and then here's the bone around it. So for me to assess from an axial view, that I can see the bone around this area itself is anywhere from D1 to D2 bone. So it's very good, very strong bone. And then we can rotate that up. And now we can look at the bone around. Right clicking on any 3D model will allow it to turn. And so in this case, I can look around and see that it's there. Uh, I like to find correlations as to what I'm seeing when I'm looking at these. So like this image right here, we're right at the gum line, so more than likely that's just where the bone ended and the soft tissue began. Also nice is that as I turn this over this way, now we see that patch that's all the way over here. So let me go ahead and get this here and then I'll turn it this way. That we see that patch that's right there. Now we look at that and we go, ooh, wow. Uh, what does that correlate to? That we have bone over here, it looks really strong, then all of a sudden, is this a cyst? What are we looking at in that bone density graph? So I'm just gonna scoot it over here so I can left click on the top of that panel and I can actually look at the 3D model as I'm looking at this. So as I move it, I can actually move it in real time to be able to tilt it to where I can see exactly where it is in the 3D models I'm looking at this. And what we find is that this correlation is actually correlated to that undercut that we had before. So that also gives me some assurance that I'm getting numbers and images that are readable and that I understand the parts to them. So in this case, we can see the undercut, we can see that we're far enough away, but we can see it exists not only on the 3D model and our pictures, but also on this density model as well. If we wanted to move the implant up and down, we could certainly, again, left click on the implant, move it up, move it down, and you can see that everything moves and correlates in real time as to the changes in the 3D um, evaluation of density, as well as the movement and any of the other views as well. So now we have this implant in place. And I think that we're happy with the placement of it. We know what the quality of bone is around it. And we're ready to go ahead and make some decisions about being able to put in either others or put in this implant itself. But at least at this point, we can say, I'm happy with what I have. And we can go over here on our output. We could go in and click Save Project. And it will dump it to our, um, our database program called Willmaster. And that way you can have it to where I've done the planning, now I'm going to save it. So now I know the angle and, um, and where it is, the size of the implant that's going to fit. So now this type of information is also something that if you're using a lab, that you can now, if you send the DICOMs and, and an STL of 
the case that you're doing, that they can also see how you've planned it, the size of implant that's in there by looking at the project. And that is also gonna give them information to where they will extract their own DICOMs from this, but in the sense that they already see what you've planned and being able to walk through this. Uh, this also gives you the ability, again, in front of the patient, you can go through all these steps in front of the patient to show where the implant's gonna be and how it's going to be as well. So now with this, I'm going to change my screen here a little bit, that with this, we have a number of different things we can do. So we, we could be done here. We've done our implant planning. We know the size and whatever along the way. Some of the things we don't know yet are about the soft tissue interactions, which means that we haven't gone through and actually looked at ways to be able to, uh, we've looked at the bone, but if this implant is a bone level implant versus a tissue level implant, what have you, that we are able to, we still haven't had anything that tells us more about our soft tissue interaction. So as we go back to dental, again, in that cross section, we see the bone, we see the abutment, we see everything in place. And again, on the 3D model, same thing, is that we see that in place, but that, again, we don't have a soft tissue interaction. So one of the things that on-demand software allows us to do is it allows us to be able to add an STL into place. So now for those of you who don't understand what an STL is, STL is a file from when you do like an interoral scan. So uh, the interoral scanners that you can use to get that information and with the information from a DICOM and from an STL, those are the two things that you would use to combine in a tertiary software like uh, Blue Sky Bios, Pro Diagnostics, uh, or, or send to a lab. And those two things will be able to help them to create a guide or a crown model or anything else from those two types of files. Now with a DICOM, DICOMs only CBCT or an imaging file. So MRIs are saved in DICOMs, medical CTs are saved in DICOMs, and the CBCT is saved in DICOMs. When you get into uh, STL files, uh, especially when we're gonna focus on the dental itself, that with an STL file, you can obtain it in a number of different ways. So again, you have the interoral scanner, uh, but you can also obtain an STL from a CBCT. And so we can actually create an STL from our CBCT to be able to make this here. So I'm gonna just pull up an example of one to where we've actually added the STLs into place. Sorry about the loading. I think everything kind of gets a little lagged as we do the Zoom meeting. But again, it allows us to be able to take that information. So in this case, um, that we had a, a willing victim to be able to do a scan and examine. And then one of the things I like to do in one of our upcoming lectures is gonna be on 3D Ceph. One of the things I like about 3D Ceph beyond the fact that you can actually do cephalometrics with your CBCT now in a 3D mode, is that at least for patient presentation, I always like to be able to tell a story. I like to be able to talk to the patient and have them relate to the information that I'm giving them. So in this case, we actually have the ability to superimpose a picture over the skull. So I could actually take a picture when the patient comes in, when they come in for their original visit, and then later on if we do a CBCT, that only in a few steps, we can actually make it to where we can wrap around the image, around the, the 3D model, so that they see their own face. So as I start to talk about how their treatment plan is going to be or what have you, now you've got their face. They see them as the patient, not just a skull or images along the way. And we can fade that out. But again, it gives you that ability to do those things and it's actually kind of just a nice presentation. So now coming back, we're gonna go back over to our DVR mode. So in our DVR mode, all I did in this case was I changed the view, so in case we wanna go back to what we were used to seeing, I turn it back into NPR so we can see that. And this is the panel that was created just in that arch curve, like we've already done in the show so far. But then you can see over on this image, and I'll blow this up so we can see it, is that I've been able to load the STLs of her upper and lower um, uh, interoral scans, and they overlap the bone. A Couple of things that are good about this is that we can actually see compliance, Every time the tooth is out of alignment, so I can take my right click over here, that you'll see some white kind of show up where either the scan didn't exist or there are, aren't agreements with that. 
but you're allowed to be able to align the STL model with your bone. And then that gives you the soft tissue interaction. So I'll kind of bring this down again. And what we can see in this image up here is that now with the STL in place, that this little red line that you see across here is the STL, and then you see the CBCT as it comes across. Nice about that again is that, I'll take down that filter, that nice again is that we can see where that soft tissue interaction is around maybe where we're putting the implant so we know that we're at the right height. If we're doing something like a bone graft, that I can bring this down and now I can see the soft tissue on either side to be able to say that on the buccal side we have some soft tissue here, depending on how high that scan went, that you're able to make those assessments because now you know where the soft tissue is as well. It'll also help you in choosing maybe an abutment or a healing cap to put on top of there so that you can know the height of what you need to have uh, so that uh, it, it protrudes through the soft tissue itself. So a lot of good things involved in that. Really is a fairly simple procedure to do so. So in this case, we would go to model and we would just go to a line. It would ask you to download the actual STL into the system itself and then find common points for it to overlap along the way. In the CT model, we can also see that these are the STLs for these. I can change the color of them so that it makes it to where or how visible it's going to be so that we can add those pieces into place. So even in the sense that if you wanted to do a facial scan, that now you could actually take a facial scan of your patient. Uh, there's actually uh, apps now on your iPhone that you can get that will be able to do a facial scan. And you could literally put a facial scan of your patient in this place and now that 3D model has it to where they not only have their facial scan on the outside, I'm gonna bring this down to size a little bit, not only will they have their facial scan on the outside, but then you could peel that back and then show, here's your soft tissue inside your mouth with your STL. And finally, you could take out those and be able to show, now here's our bone, this is what we're going to do. Again, I like it because it tells a story. It makes it to where the communication is easier. And again, in my, my days of being a clinician, that if the patient understood what the treatment plan was, I felt it was a whole lot easier for me to get across uh, what we were going to do, how we were going to do it, and get acceptance of that treatment plan because you were able to explain it to them in a way that they appreciated what it was. So just to kind of show you some interesting things to be able to put with that as well. And again, as we go through there, I realize that this may be going relatively fast for this, um, for this lecture. Um, and I expect that if there's any questions, again, obviously we have the video, you can go back and review that a little bit, but uh, we also have our education team. And feel free to reach out to our education team at any point. And they're more than happy to get on and be able to walk you through each one of these steps uh, to be able to do that. And so just, just kind of showing you these steps along the way and giving you a way in which you can see these things come into play here. So one last thing I wanted to present was being able to talk about, let me see, I have something from a chat. So again, perfect question was, uh, if our office doesn't have an interoral scanner, is there another way to create an STL file? Uh, with that in mind, that yes, there is. So uh, ways in which to create an STL file, uh, for an interoral in this case, is that you have an interoral scanner, but if you don't have an interoral scanner, that you can actually create an impression and make a cement model, scan the cement model. You could just take an impression and scan the impression. Uh, with that in mind, that you're changing a little bit of the accuracy associated with that. So usually in the terms of STL accuracy, that an interval scanner is superior, but then next to it would be the stone model. And the reason why the stone model is, is it's already been impressed, it's not gonna expand or contract, and then it's gonna be sitting there on a model stand. And we actually have model stands that we can use to scan with our CBCT. And then you can also do the impression. With the impression though, the software is going to need to invert that impression to create a positive out of a negative. And so you're adding levels of possible error associated with that. So again, it would be interoral scanner would be first, stone model scan from a CBCT would be second, and impression scan would be third as far as, um, as part of predictable accuracy associated with that. Now, how can we do that? I think I have some examples over here. And again, I'll take down my uh, 
controls here for a second is that again we've shown how to do this is that uh, we will go through and and be able to I'm just going to minimize this for a second actually I'll go over here and download it so I'm gonna I have some loaded on my computer in my desktop so I have something right here and something right here so just to go back one that's and I'll open it here so we can take a look at it is just to give you an idea as to what the the model stand looks like this would be an, a, an example of our model stand so it goes where the uh, patient uh, chin holder is it actually snaps into the same place and it comes out here as a projection that it also has styrofoam in the middle uh, the styrofoam essentially gives a density difference between the uh, this stone model and the stand itself so you don't have if this was sitting right on the plastic itself it's very hard to differentiate those densities and keep them apart whereas if we can create something that is essentially mostly air i.e the styrofoam that this now will show up as a scan that's floating into space so that's why this model is the way it is and being able to do the scan throughout that. So let me just go ahead and minimize this. So now I'm here. So we can just look at the lower stone here. And again, these are DICOMs here. So we're gonna go ahead and ask it to be in a DICOM analyzed view. Open it up and take a peek at it. So we're in place here. Just going to window that out to where we can see what it is. Now you can see that we have we have some of this blurring around here. We can go into our fine tuning and be able to move that up or down to create where we can see the image itself. So again, this would be what the image would look like as our stone model sitting into place. So now we have something in which we have the stone model and we can now work from that stone model to be able to now build an STL from that stone model itself. And all we have to do through the software is a couple moves to be able to grow that, fill it into place, and then we can actually turn that into an STL. So this would be what a scan of a stone model would look like. And in this case, the ability to be able to have that soft tissue interaction around those teeth so you can interact that with the um, CBCT you already have in play. So a lot of different things we can do, a lot of ways we can, we can change all this to be able to make this into an STL and then superimpose it over. So it gives us a lot of different directions we can go into. So at this point, we've gone through uh, implant planning. We've gone through looking at the different implants that we can use. We can have uh, assessing our bone, assessing where the implants are going to be that we talked about. Now we can actually integrate an STL into our image itself. And then we can be able to make sure that we can overlap it. So now we can uh, put in our implant planning where we know where the soft tissue is. We talked about abutments. And we've also talked about ways in which we can obtain an STL along the way. With that in mind, we're about 40 minutes in. Uh, I'd like to open it up the forum to be able to see if anybody has any more questions. So with that in mind, uh, we have our chat room that's off to the side or feel free to unmute your, your uh, microphone. If there's a direct question that you have, Obviously, I'd love to share it with everybody that's listening on so that we know if, you know, most of the time people have a question, it's usually something that other people have a question about as well. So I'm going to open it up. So if there's a question from anybody, I'll let that happen now. Okay, I'm not seeing any questions come across. And again, if you don't want to ask questions during the forum, that's absolutely fine. Um, uh, you know, again, I, I know we're all kind of in our daily work and we're doing it right in the middle of the day. So, but 
Uh, if you do have any questions, again, feel free to reach out to myself or my team uh, to be able to have us answer those questions for you. Um, at HDX Will, we're more than happy to answer our phones. Our education team is waiting to hear from you and, uh, and help you be able to, to get more out of your CBCT. Um, otherwise, with that in mind, good 41 minute lecture here. Uh, and again, if there's any other questions or anything else like that, please, please feel free. I have one more chat question. So when manipulating the 3D image, how do you get back to the original position? This is actually a fantastic thing because uh, I find myself, as you saw me playing around with this as I'm talking, that sometimes you can get yourself twisted because normally in a 3D image, if you right click on it, you can move it around. So in, the, in that sense that this shows our orientation, so we're looking at it from posterior in this case, uh, because it's a model stand, it may be a little bit different, but you can see as I'm looking around, now I'm looking at it from the head down and that you have uh, the right side is over here. But as I move it around, it's really hard to get it back to straight again. So we have these up here that we can use. Again, uh, we also have videos on all this on our website uh, under the, uh, under the uh, customer portal. So you can actually go through and look at the videos and we go through this, but one, again, 3D image that we can go and we can look at it from the head, from the foot, anterior, posterior, in this case, because it was just placed in that position that those are opposite from the left and from the right. So that's a way to reset that 3D image so that as you're moving it around and examining it, that it's really hard to put back manually, but to be able to then turn it back to where you have quick movements to get it back where you belong, that's a great way to do it. Thank you, Dr. Sachs, for that question. Any other questions? Fantastic. All right. Well, thank you very much for attending. Uh, again, next week we are going through and we're going to make a determination as to which one of the topics we're going to do next week. Um, you'll receive an email about it. Uh, and we're just working with this on a weekly basis. And again, as we go about this educational process, that if you have any topics that you'd like to have covered, that uh, again, whether it be something that I can be able to go through with the software or if it's something that that we can get a you know, dental professional, uh, a dentist, a dental radiologist, any of those things that would help you and your practice to make you better and to make more use out of your CBCT, please let me know. Send me an email um, or you know, ask a question on here. This only makes it better for our CBCT users to have the information that they need, and I'll be able to try to find a way to make sure that we can get that information to you. Otherwise, Thank you for joining today. I appreciate your attention. Uh, again, oh, we have one more question. Just jump up. Oh, okay. No, it was just a thank you. And you're very welcome. I'm more than happy to do this. Uh, and again, please call us. If you have any questions, let us know. Again, my name is Tim Todek. I'm director of HDX Will North America. And thank you for attending.